everyone i welcome you all again to the jaw developer communities podcast series and today we have a very special guest with us you know that it's a very amazing things to have entrepreneurs coming up to the podcast and sharing their journey and this time we have uh, we have elaine uh, is with us who is a uh, amazing person who actually uh, who who used to uh, like work at shift uh, as like it's it's been more than 30 years uh, at shift and now currently he is uh, working at ipit as a chief commercial officer and also he's one of the founding member as well so with that note i welcome you uh, elen uh, to our podcast and how are you doing today thanks shavi thanks for having me i'm i'm going good right we, we're not located in the same continent nowadays but uh, you're in india i'm actually back in europe so i'm going very well um different temperature as well i mean it's very cold here in belgium today that's amazing too exactly like the temperature and everything is totally different in the different countries yeah. <laughs> okay so uh firstly i want to start uh up with like how was this transition like it's been more than 30 years that you have been co- uh, like uh contributing to shift and now it's ipit so how's everything going on and wh- why you actually tra- uh, like why you actually shifted from one to another uh well first of all let me tell you it's going very well <laughs> yes indeed that you're very right Xavi. i mean i spent more than 30 years of my career at um, at swift right in in different uh, functions different uh, locations as well um in, in europe in belgium in paris a bit in london as well in the last the last uh, 11 years in singapore um uh, i've been member of the swift executive committee for more than 14 years and and the last function that I hold was the chief commercial uh, chief business development officer in that company right and yes you could argue uh, wh- what it is about moving from a very large international corporations like swift that is supporting financial, the financial industry in more than 200 countries to actually becoming an entrepreneur and um, and you know developing a, a, a brand new fintech uh, small at this point of time but very, with a lot of ambitions and great ideas Uh, I, I have to say the transition transition went very fine, right? I mean, uh, I guess that also because uh, I would see several reasons. One is that in my mind, um, uh, I've always been a little bit of an entrepreneur, and I and I would guess that when uh, when you are actually chief business development officer and you're looking at developing the business of a company like 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 Swift, you're always looking for more for. innovation for doing things differently for your clients so in that in that context you are you have to be always a little bit of an entrepreneur right but then you move into something is much smaller uh, and i would guess that uh, the reasons that that really push me to um, to to supporting ip is 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 twofold one um, i think um, the origin, the original co-founder came with great ideas about how to improving customers experience in the context of um, international payments and i guess that will come back to that in a minute and the second also is the personality of my partners right i mean these are youngsters amazing guys also with some uh, with a lot of payments exp- experience some of them coming from swift as well uh, and it's, it's really the mix between ideas innovation the bringing the technology but also the personality right ultimately you're working with people and, and that is really the thing that keeps motivating me the most is uh, the quality of the people i'm working with that's actually great to hear and also like wanted to know that how you started and also uh, tell us something more about the company like about your startup yeah so so i bid um, i bid stands for international payments id right and actually we're not a payments company i mean it's a bit of a strange thing that we have payments you know in our name right but uh, actually the, the 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 creation of the company or the idea to fund that company come came from some of the observation that we've made into um, the payments industry right observation i essentially made about the customer customer's experience that you, you 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 need to have when it comes to international payments and it's fair to say that if you look at all investment that have been made or poured into the financial the, in the payments industry over the last say, 15 years a lot have been actually directed to improving speed and improving cost of payments and and if you look for instance at domestic payments it's great right uh, in your country with UPI and PCI and all that the country literally move in a, in a in a couple of years to 
you know, lousy payments industry domestically to an amazing thing where anyone can pay anyone else actually in a matter of seconds for actually zero cost, right? So tremendous development that India made. And you can see the same thing happening in many other countries. I, if, I think my last count is, is about more than 60 countries that have now their real-time payments, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure domestically. Where I was living before, Singapore, they have that. Belgium has that. So all of that went tremendously well. Uh, well. Cost as well. In most of those countries nowadays, right, making a payment costs you zero, right? You don't pay anything. It's for free, right? Uh, now, you have also a lot of payments that have been poured into or directed to improving customer's experience, essentially at domestic level, right? Where you have uh, new overlays that have been there actually to really improving uh, things like request to pay, things like proxy payments, QR code payments, uh, you know, that you have in some countries in in Singapore, you can pay with pay no anything with your QR code. Uh, in Holland, same thing. So all of that really improved the customer experience. No, when you move this to an international level, that you don't have. You, you don't have yet uh, the sort of interoperability mechanism that connect actually all these customers uh, cu customers experience overlays all together and that's what ip's ipad uh, ambition we want to connect those those overlays we by really improving ways in which you can validate or actually fetch the data of the payee you want to pay to so that's that that has been the the the, uh, the original id that we came up with that was about 14 months ago companies based on that has been uh, founded in, in, in Singapore, incorporated in Singapore. Uh, uh, we spent a lot of time developing the platform as well, the APIs. Um, you might have read also that um, we completed a, a round of investors uh, over the summer. So we raised actually quite a substantial amount of money to be able to really boosting our developments. And, uh, and that's what we're doing at this point of time. That's pretty much amazing to know about the company and what is the whole vision about it. So uh, moving with that, this is one thing that uh, domestic payments in most of the countries are fast, as you just mentioned, right? Yeah. And also efficient at the same time. But in the cross border space, if I talk about the payment uh, process remains complicated and the customer experience also gets lack many yeah. a times. So what is the actual problem according to you and how to like cope up with that? I had sometimes actually the, the, the questions, um, which is about, I mean, can we can we make international payments as fast, as efficient as you could have domestically, right? My response is always the same, right? You say, yes, technologically, you can make it, right? Actually, you could even argue that today, you have already the rails that makes it possible, right? It's transferring, you know, some money from one place of the world, like where, you know, today in Belgium, all the way to you in Mumbai. I mean, from a technological point of view, it's possible, right? It's just a matter of what I would call latency. Yeah, it may take a little bit more time just for distance, physical distance point of view from if you make a payment from France or Belgium to France or Belgium to Australia, right? Now, the problem that you have is that when it comes to international payments, you have many, many, many other processes that have to intervene during actually the transfer. And, and these are steps like foreign exchange. I mean, if I'm paying you in India, well, it's likely it's not going to be in, in Europe, right? It, the payments will have to arrive eventually in, in rupee, right? Or in US dollars. So you have a foreign exchange that needs to be there as well. You have also some countries that still apply what we call foreign exchange controls. So you, you cannot really pay anyone else in other countries the same way you want to do it, right? Right. Then you have also many processes that are about uh, f what we call financial crime and, and uh, compliance uh, controls, right? So is, is the person that, you know, the, you're paying to is, is the right person, right? Is, is it not something that is actually under criminal uh, sanctions? So all these processes are basically happening, right, uh, during the transfer of the money, right? And that makes them actually a lot longer, right? Uh, and the problem that you're facing also uh, with those processes is that as you are actually moving the money from one country to another one, right? It may be that the regulation context of the two countries you're talking about are slightly different or very different, right? And that makes actually the process even more cumbersome. So I would argue that 
there might be a way over time because technology of, of course always help to make this a lot more efficient right uh, the, perhaps the best way would be to make sure that all regulators governments all that are, are really aligning all the you know laws legislations uh, regulations and make this possible right I would guess that well, I can see at this point of time this is far from being the truth, right? I mean, it is not really alignment into this, and it's going to take a long time to make it possible. But for the rest, technology can really make things a lot better than it, it is. It used to be, it is today, and, and certainly for the future, yes. Okay, got it. And also, uh, are the problems in cross-border payments the same across all the countries, or like they vary? Uh, uh, well. <laughs> Not really, not really. I mean, uh, you could argue that when it comes to um, uh, something that I've been witnessing in Marquee for many years, because obviously I've been based in Europe for many years, right? And is that if you look at regions like Europe, right? And I will even say actually the Eurozone, right? Um, so the Europe went uh, with some countries to actually having a single currency about 22 years ago. You remember actually it was in the year 2000, right? That the, those countries... Uh, went to having a, a, a single currency. So in that context, if you really want to leverage the power for all these economies together to have a single currency, you had to have also all the infrastructures that actually can can multiply the effect of having single currency. When I say these infrastructures, I'm talking about payment systems, uh, security settlement systems, all of that, that really makes the financial industry uh, uh, really efficient, right? Europe took a long time to make this a reality. I mean, from the time that you had Euro coming in to making all this infrastructure and all that, it took literally 10 years. You have heard about SEPA as well in Europe. All of that, over time, made uh, the cross uh, or intra-regional payments in Europe, across country, within the Eurozone, and even actually within Europe, outside of the Eurozone, a lot more efficient than it used to be. Actually, today, you're paying between France and Belgium literally in a second, right? And and you don't pay actually as well. There's no cost. There's no cost embedded in, into this. So so all of that became a lot more efficient. Right? If you look another region, ASEAN, for instance, in Southeast Asia, the, the, there has been already at the time some of these some of these ideas about, I mean, creating eventually over time a single economical um, you know environment, eventually leading to a single currency. You would argue that that region is far off, you know, achieving this at this point of time. But yet, I mean, you have they have developed a lot of economical uh, links in between the countries, and you see there as well that some payment systems start inter interconnecting to each other. Uh, for instance, recently you've seen Singapore with the pay no services now connecting and integrating with uh, PronPay in Thailand. So you have now these two systems completely interconnected and you can pay, and we might come back to that in a minute, through a proxy. If I have an account in Singapore, I want to pay a friend that I have in Bangkok, I can pay through a proxy, have his phone number and up, off you go, right? You might have heard also that the same connection might happen pretty soon with India. So there is no, this kind of bilateral connections that are happening between some countries. But it, it is still very rare. I mean, fair to say that you have this Europe as that. Um, yeah, ASEAN is developing this a little bit. Um, but you, in Africa, you have some like SADC region, Eastern African regions. They're trying to make this, this kind of a, uh, environment, but, but it will take a lot more, more time to reaching at least a level that, you have, for instance, you have in Europe, where you have several countries sharing a single currency, but also having common payments infrastructures. That was actually fabulous to understand and also know. And uh, like, this is again one thing, like can we actually uh, envisage uh, a day where a customer can effect cross-border payment similar to UPI, okay, at the click of a button? Because if so, by when and what are the enablers that would be there? I, I, well, I don't have any crystal ball in front of me, I'm afraid. So I, I cannot really tell you when, right? Um, I think, frankly, I mean, for all the, the reasons I've told you before, right? I, I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be difficult. Now, frankly, my my question is the following: Do we, do I really care if the money gets there in a second or five seconds or eventually in half an hour? 
What I really care when I'm paying internationally, right, is that it's more like, am I really sure that the money will get to the place you, I want it to go? Okay. Am I really sure that what I'm paying today, say I'm transferring you, Xavi, I'm, I'm transferring you 100 euros. Am I really sure this actually 100, this is exactly the 100 euros eventually in rupee, right, that will get to your account at you? right and, and not eventually it's somebody else right okay will i get the confirmation that the money effectively reach your account that's what i care when it comes to at least me when it comes to customer's experience right I, i'm not really caring about is it is it one minute five minutes well of course i don't want to have i don't want to have three days or four days like it used to be but for me frankly if it is an hour i'm fine as long as i know i'm sure that it would get to you and as long as somewhere also I can receive a confirmation that it has reached you. That was really very insightful and that's a pretty much true thing that you also mentioned about yeah people are uh, like worried about the other thing yeah. not about the time. And, and, and believe, but believe me it's, it's even more because of course I mean you have many many different segments in the payments industry but, but say, I mean, talk especially coming from your country, right? Many, many, you have tens and tens of millions of foreign workers in the Middle East, in Africa, coming from India, coming from Bangladesh, coming from Pakistan, uh, uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, you name them, right? And, and those people are not always, fair to say, very well educated, right? They don't have the sort of savviness you know, to, to using all these tools, right? So in their mind, when they're remitting money back home, they, 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 they want to have that certainty. They want to have the comfort that it gets to the right place, right? Uh, being paid to an account or being paid to a wallet, they really make sure that their mother, their father, the children get the money the right way, right? And that's where a little bit actually we try to, what we try to do at IP. Okay, that was uh, really great to hear the uh, like things that you just mentioned that were really insightful. So moving with the questions, uh, I just wanted to know one thing that uh, like as we got to know that IPID, uh, w what all stuff IPID does. So how IPID is solving the problems in the cross-border payments? So how so, is it? Based? Well, well, funny thing is that what we do, we can do internationally for cross-border payments. Actually, actually, we can even actually help some countries which do not have yet the kind of infrastructures domestically as well. But but let's talk about cross-border for the time being. So what, what we do, what we've done is is building a, a platform, right, that, that we do operate. And that basically connects in one side what we call our clients, right? And our clients will be in a B2B space all clients will be banks, will be fintechs, uh, payments, gateways, you name them, right? Um, clients basically, that basically uh, help anyone initiating payments to anyone else, right? And on, on the other side of the platform, we have what we call partners, which are typically data providers. So basically, we, we connect those people because we know that they help, they can help us providing certainty about for instance the existence the existence of the account you want to pay to right or providing us the necessary information to making sure that to matching the name of the account holder with the name of the payee the person you want to pay to right so basically we're connecting these two walls right um, and then therefore from there through apis when anyone like you but again, you want to pay somebody else into the country, you go to your normal payment service provider, being anyone, a bank or something else. And that institution, once actually before initiating the payments, will connect through a platform, will go and validate the information about the payee. And basically, we return to the payment initiator a, a, a match results, if you like, about the account and the account on the older name. And then from there, you can initiate the payments. So therefore, as I said at the beginning, we're not doing really the payments, right? We are actually an important step before initiating the payments. So once the information is validated through a platform, then the payer can initiate the payments with a level of certainty which is much higher, and the payments will go through its normal channel, the normal rails that it would have 
than today, right? And those channels can be those rails, could be Swift, could be uh, Wise, could be Revolut. I mean, all the, the payments network that you know today that has an international level. That was uh, good to know. And also, as you mentioned about the countries, so again, it's it's, it's a very personal question of mine. I would uh, be asking Ellen from you that uh, what are your plans for India? Okay, I, I also wanted to know your plans of India and uh, like as it's international payment uh, thing. So how the things are going in India? Can you just tell me something about that? Well, I have good news when it comes to your country. <laughs> uh, actually, we, you know, for the, for the last, what, six, seven, eight months, we spent a great deal of time to ensuring that we can access to the right data. Right and, and and getting access or developing the relationship with companies, payment systems, uh, central banks that can offer us access to those data. Right, and I'm pleased to report that actually the two first corridors that we are going to open right very soon in a few weeks from now, certainly by year end, will be India, and will be United States. So we're going to have by the end of the year um, these two uh, countries open, which means that. By the end of the year or the beginning of the, the 2023, we'll be able to validate any account in India or any account in the United States. So any, anyone who wish to pay, I don't know, anyone else in the United States will be able to validate the existence of that account, the name, the, the account holder name, all of that. The same for India as well. Uh, so yes, and, and then from there, we're going to have other countries coming up, uh, some countries in uh, Southeast Asia, some other countries also in Africa. Um, we also very proactive in uh, enabling countries in uh, opening corridors in uh, in Europe, which is obviously a, a massive target. We obviously concentrate uh, on what I, I would call the the high throughput um, corridors, right? The, the the ones where you have a, a lot a lot of transactions. And of course, when it comes to India, India being one of the if not the largest remittance corridor in the world. Uh, it, it makes it made sense. It was making sense for us uh, to ensuring India there. Yes, that was so good to hear that, and I'm pretty much uh, waiting for that only. That the moment I'll uh, I'll be telling people that uh, the the things that you are able to do is uh, by the person with whom I recorded podcast previous year. It's gonna be a very let's, amazing thing for let, me. Let, let, let's remember also, Shavi, that. We do that in a B2B environment. So you're not going to see an iPad app, right? I mean, oh, got it. the iPads will be embedded into other companies' apps. It will be embedded into banking application. It will be embedded into, uh, you know, foreign uh, foreign remitters uh, in, in the Middle East. I mean, that that these will be your clients, right? You know, I'm, I'm not going to start looking at... Uh, uh, at you, for instance, to become a, a retail client to us. That's, uh, that, that's not the purpose. At least it's not the purpose at this point of time. We, we want to first starting with the B2B environment and then eventually over time we'll see, but it's not actually in our agenda for the time being. That's really good to hear that. And it's, it's going to be really much amazing. I'm uh, looking forward to it. And uh, like, like concluding this podcast with any of the future plans that you have apart from this, anything that uh, like... Since New Year is on the way, so <laughs> anything? <laughs> no, listen, listen. We, we, you know, I mean, we are very much conscious that we, you know, we we still a small company, right? We have uh, high ambitions, high hopes. I think we uh, we, we don't believe that we're going to be the only one solving this problem, right? I mean, I think that we cannot, we don't want to boil the ocean. I mean, we know that there will be competition. We know that actually. If if we as an industry want to solve that problem, you're gonna have a you need you're gonna have to have a, some other actors as well. But you know there's place also from for others right to do that with the chance to be to be still actually quite unique and one of the if not the only player that does that at at that scale and which is great to do. Um, and then yes, we'll remain focused very much into making sure that we can open as many corridors that are, as I mentioned before as quickly as possible making sure we deliver what we need to deliver with the highest possible level of quality. That is really important when it comes to customer experience, is that what we do works. And then from there, yes, we have other plans, right? We have uh, other APIs uh, that are in development that will keep actually enhancing the, the, the level of service that I'm talking to you, right? I mean, by, by ensuring proxy payments through a phone number, 
um, uh, and, and with the same level of certainty when it comes to the quality of the pay data, um, all of that. So we have we have actually a roadmap defined, uh, but I guess it may be the subject of another podcast anytime soon, right? That was amazing, amazing. And also looking forward to those stuff. And uh, with that note, thank you so much, uh, Erin, for joining in. It, it was so, so, so great. We talked about a lot of stuff and especially a lot of future plans as well. Uh, so with that note, thank you so much for joining in. It was really, really great hosting you today. Thank you, Shavi. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.